Good. Let's pray. Creator, we thank you for this time. I ask that you would speak through me. Let it be your words conveyed, your thoughts. I pray that there be hearts open to hear what you have to say. In your name we pray. Amen. So good morning. Welcome. I join you from the newly painted St. George's. It looks really good. Um, I'm looking at two beautiful HD cameras, and I'm excited to be here. It does make me a little sad that it'll be a little bit longer before lots of you will be able to see it, but I have been feeling a little bit more hopeful recently, and I am a pretty bad pessimist, so if I'm getting hopeful, then, then it must mean something good, because with the COVID situation, we have been ramping up vaccinations pretty heavily. We're about 300,000 a day in Canada, and that's, that's crazy. We've seen, we've seen COVID numbers drop, and that's something to be excited for, because as COVID vaccinations ramp up, we can hope for a future where we can be together and finally be able to see the church um, painted in all ways. So we've been waiting in anticipation for vaccines, and I know for me specifically since the day the pandemic started, we, we kind of knew that it was going to be vaccines that would bring us back to normality. And this Sunday in the church calendar, we are in anticipation of next week. We're looking forward to Pentecost. We find ourselves in the middle of Ascension Day, where we celebrate Jesus ascending into heaven after he finishes the resurrection and his subsequent ministry. And then next week, we're looking forward to Pentecost, where we celebrate the Holy Spirit being sent onto the believers to continue Jesus's ministry. As you can imagine, if you think back to the early believers and what they experienced, it would have been an incredibly anxious and stressful time. They had just witnessed their leader uh, do this incredible, incredibly miraculous thing of being resurrected and then ascending into heaven. But they're still waiting for the Spirit to come. Jesus had left them, and they were in incredible anticipation of something good coming. So with that setting in mind, let's jump into our passage, John 17, verse verse 6 to 19. If you have your Bible open, please turn to John 17, verse 6 to 19. And before we jump in, I just want to preface with talking about John, and specific the Gospel of John, and noting how much more poetic and and the the interesting storytelling devices that John uses in, in the Greek, John is the most complex gospel. So we need to look at what, what John says and the uniqueness of, of John's words, and that it's even why it's even more important to pull important things out. So as we exegete, as we do exegesis, meaning we're going through this passage, pulling out important things to interpret and talk about. So we join Jesus in prayer, John 17, verse 6. And we need to stop already. We need to stop because we need to understand how how insane it is that Jesus, where we join him here, he has just come to the realization of his imminent departure, of his imminent crucifixion and death, and what he has to accomplish. He's just come to this, this fact that this is going to happen soon. And what does he do? He stops in prayer. Do we follow Jesus? I know my first reaction when faced with immense anticipation is not to kneel in prayer, But if we see this in Jesus, it probably should be something we try to emulate. So let's continue. Verse 6. Jesus prays, You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. He's referring to the disciples that God has given them, has God given Jesus, and he says that they have obeyed your word. And we should take comfort from this statement that Jesus says, because we know that the disciples' faith has been far from perfect. We see them doubt. We see them, we see them question Jesus. We see them not fully realize who Jesus is to the very end. But Jesus still says that they obeyed God's word and that he says that they belonged to God. How often do we question our own faith? How often are we anxious about our convictions? We think they're not just quite good enough. But Jesus says here that if you only believe in him and what he has revealed, then, then you still belong to God. And that's something that we should get excited for. Verse 9, let's move on. Jesus says, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world. He's praying for the disciples and not the world. At first glance, that statement seems troubling, right? And Jesus doesn't, what do you mean Jesus doesn't pray for the world? But we should see that this is a specific prayer. It is not exclusive, but inclusive. He's including all the people that believed in him. 
if the world decided to put their faith in Jesus, they would then become included in that prayer. So he's not excluding the world, but he's only praying for the disciples. So it, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be worried that Jesus isn't praying for the entire world in this message. But indirectly he is, because he's praying for the disciples to reach the world. So indirectly he is praying for the world to be brought to him. Verse 11 Jesus prays, I will remain in the world no longer. We see him comment that he's, he knows he's going to leave soon. He's, he's revealing that he's praying because he's a little worried about what's going to happen once he leaves. He prays that they might be as one as we are one. Jesus says that he's experienced oneness in the midst of disciples. If you remember the last time I talked, I talked about this Greek word perichoresis, referring to the relationship between the Trinity and the relationality that they have and the oneness, that holistic oneness that they experience. Jesus says that he experienced it with the disciples. And he's praying that the disciples will experience that when he's gone. In John 10 30, he refers to this oneness as important for the oneness in the mission of bringing God's kingdom in. He's referring to the oneness of the body of believers in order for the world to see it and through that believe in him. It's easy for, for words like oneness to become Christianized, it's becoming so used that it goes in one ear right out the other. We don't really understand the meaning. So, so, so let's just think about that. Unity among disciples, oneness, is integral, Jesus says, for the sake of the mission that we're trying to accomplish, ultimately bringing the new kingdom and looking forward to that. But what a convicting thought that Jesus says the unity among the church, both local and global, is essential to bringing in the kingdom. It's essential for the mission. That's something that we should not look at lightly, and I hope we see that. Verses 12. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. This is a reference to Judas, as we saw in the Acts passage as well, who betrayed Jesus to fulfill scripture. We hear that all the time. We hear the, the, the happenstance of Judas often. And I remember when, when I first had to think about this theologically, it did not make sense, and honestly, it still doesn't. That's a loaded statement that, that Judas had to betray Jesus to fulfill a prophecy. This is a little bit of a tangent, but if you've ever thought of going back to school to do a master's or PhD, may I present to you this thesis uh, topic, the prophecy and subsequent fulfillment of Judas's betrayal. Because this is a question that I've had, and I've never fully been satisfied with anybody's answer. Nothing that I've read has left me feeling okay about it. If one disciple had to betray Jesus, it seemed clear that, that God and Jesus knew it was Judas. Did Judas really have a choice in that? Was Judas condemned from that start when Jesus called him? What does it mean about free will and predestination? These are all really crazy questions. And you could write a whole PhD on that. And I encourage you to do that if you want to. But you don't have to. Anyways, I digress. Here's the word of the day. Are you ready? A Greek word, apolia. Apolia. Dylan can correct my uh, Greek pronunciation if that's wrong. But it's a word which means destruction. And Jesus uses it. But when it's used in the New Testament, it denotes eternal destruction. Notice not eternal punishment or torment. Eternal destruction, destruction that is definite. What can that speak to our idea of hell or, or punishment or what happens to people who don't believe? Just a thought. Let's move to verses 13 and 14 where Jesus says, The world and how they are not of the world, the world hates them. We do need to understand that the world that Jesus is referring to is not the literal creation or, or the earth in general or life, but it is in reference to the Jewish religious elite who are antagonistic towards Jesus and towards the believers. I often hear people use, we're not of this world, our home is in heaven, to, to say that we can, we can just escape the world and we don't need to worry about what happens here. And please listen when I say this passage does not allow for escapist theology. 
meaning that we can just abandon the world because it doesn't matter or we're destined for another place. But Jesus is referring here specifically of the world, the people who are antagonistic of him. Verse 15, Jesus says that his prayer is not to take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one, referring here to their idea of Satan. And up to this point in John's gospel, Jesus always refers to Satan, an adversary to himself, pointing towards that he thinks Satan is trying to kill him or end him. But Jesus says that he's worried after he leaves that, he, that the evil one will target the disciples, so he's praying against that. And in the end, verses 18, 19, Jesus ends his prayer for the disciples by exhorting God to continue what is being accomplished through him to continue through the disciples, continue the work that he has started and continue to sanctify them. I hope that we can get the, the full reality and how, how crazy it is that Jesus, as he's realized his, his near future, stops and he's praying for others. He realizes he's, he's going to die soon, and he stops and he prays that the disciples would continue the work and continue to be sanctified. So what are our, our big questions that we can glean from this passage? Well, we can ask ourselves, what are we anticipating? What are we excited for? How are we actively working to participate in bringing that in? So as I have been anticipating getting the vaccine, as of 7 p.m. last night, everyone 20 and up could book your vaccination appointment. And today it's, it's everyone 18 and up at 7 p.m. But at 7 p.m. last night, uh, I, was, I was refreshing my email every minute, waiting for my email to say I could book my vaccine. And at that same time, at around 7 p.m., I was just uh, editing my sermon and getting it ready for today and highlighting it and doing all these things. And I found myself anxious in anticipation of getting my vaccine. And I wanted it at, right at 7 p.m. waiting for my email. And, and I read what I had wrote here. And this is, this is a thought that's my own, so you can disagree with it if you want. But this is, this is the thought, that anticipation necessitates action. Anticipation necessitates action. Anticipation doesn't require action. It necessitates action. Because thoughtful action insinuates that you had anticipated it. So as I was anticipating it and my vaccine appointment, and I was just trying to refresh, 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 and I was worried, I read that, and I just wrote about how Jesus, in his anticipation, stopped all he was worrying about and prayed about it. So I was convicted in that, and, and I, I started praying because, I mean, I, I should probably do what I just wrote about what Jesus was doing. So I prayed, and I said, God, just calm my anxiety, and I just prayed that this email would come so that I would be able to book my vaccine, because I'm very excited for it. And as soon as I ended my prayer, the email—no, I'm kidding. It did not come through that right after my prayer. It actually came in when I woke up this morning, and I was able to book my vaccine for next Wednesday, which I'm very excited for. But that's how my anticipation— made me act. For Jesus, the anticipation of his coming death and crucifixion inspired action through prayer. So what actions do anticipation of the incoming climate crisis inspire of us? I had the pleasure of being a part of the Synod for the Diocese of New Westminster yesterday, and a lot of what we talked about was about bringing in proposals and changes to, to look at the climate crisis and what we can do to address it. That's a very good thing that we can, we can do actions to anticipate what is coming. But what about other huge topics? Like what about the anticipation of peace that we want to see with Israel and Palestine? How does our anticipation of that necessitate action? Ultimately, what about anticipation of the coming kingdom, of new creation? What are we acting on? And this time in the church calendar, as we mentioned, we are eagerly awaiting Pentecost. We are awaiting the celebration and remembrance of when the Holy Spirit came onto the believers, and we are praying for, for a new, a fresh spirit to wash over us. We are waiting for the Holy Spirit to continue the ministry of Jesus. So what does the anticipation of that event call us to do? What action are you feeling called to complete in your anticipation of that celebration. Perhaps you were feeling called to mirror the actions of Jesus and enter prayer and pray for it. Maybe like the disciples, it's time to prepare and get excited about it. Or maybe you're feeling called to just strengthen your faith 
and find belief, maybe for the first time. All of those actions we can see mirrored in Jesus and in the early disciples. So as we leave, as we think about these things, what, we've reve- what was revealed through Jesus' actions and how we can, what we can glean from it, let's reflect on what our anticipation of the coming pen- celebration of Pentecost is calling us to do and, and our anticipation of other things that are important to us. Anticipation necessitates action. So let's pray, and let's pray for those things. Creator of power, we, and we, t- we anticipate and look forward to the celebration of Pentecost. And may the boldness of your Spirit transform us. May the gentleness of your Spirit lead us. May we be emboldened to act by the power of your Spirit. And may the gifts of your Spirit be our goal and our strength now and always. Amen.